Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. On April 16, 2014, the MV Sewol, a ferry bound for the island of Jeju, capsized off the coast of Jindo County, the southwesternmost region of South Korea. Out of the 476 people on board, 304 died, most of them from Danwon High School in the city of Ansan. The Sewol disaster is one of the biggest human catastrophes in South Korea's recent history and has triggered a significant amount of perplexity and soul-searching among its citizens. How could a disaster of this magnitude occur in such a technologically advanced country? Why were the rescue efforts so uncoordinated and inefficient? Is South Korea's pali-pali culture to blame, putting profit ahead of people's safety? The families of the victims have been looking for answers ever since, and continue to demand that an independent inquiry shed light on what really happened. Our guest for this episode, Jude Michael Park, has been following the Sewell families in their struggles, documenting their lives in the aftermath of the tragedy, in their quest for truth and justice. We talk about his work, what the Sewell families are trying to achieve, and how we can explain the hatred far-right groups have demonstrated against them. Jun Michael Park is a documentary photographer and visual storyteller from Seoul. He has worked for Der Spiegel, Welt am Sonntag, Cicero Magazine, and Brand 1 in Germany, as well as Greenpeace East Asia, Save the Children, Asia Society, Korea Center, and many more. Jun is a winner of a silver award in the Press Feature Story category at the Prix de la Photographie Paris 2015 and is selected for this year's Eddie Adams Workshop in New York. June Michael Park, welcome to Korea and the World. Uh, thank you for having me. On your website, you describe yourself as a documentary photographer. What do you mean when you use uh, this term? I use the term documentary uh, to distinguish myself and my work from hard news. Of course, my projects and my work have certain social bearings and uh, news pack from time to time, but they are all self-funded and self-initiated. When I'm on an assignment for a publication, my job is to uh, illustrate the story uh, through photography. But when I'm doing personal projects, I'm more of an independent documentarian. I have more freedom uh, to be personal and opinionated in my approach mm. and interpretation of the subject. As you mentioned, uh, Dong Demun and Sewol started out as, as personal projects and they were later uh, published in mainstream media. What, what draws you to these issues? You mentioned the Dongdaemun district of Seoul. Uh, I think you also worked on pro-democracy protests in, in Hong Kong. Of course, the Seoul. Why do you focus on socially and politically contentious issues? I don't really know. I guess I'm, I'm drawn to um, you know, marginalized people and the places and their stories. Because of a sense of justice or because you find, uh, I would say, visually interesting that it really tells a story, it's something you want to convey? Sense of justice is uh, definitely there, but mm -hmm. I guess I just, I just feel empathetic mm -hmm. towards these people and places. And uh, if you will, I guess uh, I would like to make small contributions to improving the general human conditions with my photography. Do you approach these topics with an agenda, so to speak, or do you perceive yourself as a neutral observer, if that is even possible? As a journalist, I hold myself to the rigor of journalist integrity. But when I'm doing personal projects, I'm more of an editorialist and an author with a point of view. And the debate about photographers' neutrality, to me, is a bit outdated. Because, say, the act of taking a photo, by nature, is subjective. You know, when you try to uh, compose a frame, you include certain elements or you, or you leave out certain elements. And by doing that, you are already making a subjective choice. Uh, when you and when you click the shutter, that photograph represents uh, only a fragment of the reality. And the photographer's vision and interpretation of the reality, consciously or subconsciously, uh, is built into uh, into the photograph. Mm. Are you trying to evoke something specific in, in those who see your photos? The the photos you took, for example, of the, the empty classrooms in which the victims of the Sewol disaster once studied. They certainly evoke a very powerful emotion. Um, when I'm taking a picture, I don't really think ahead about how the viewer will perceive it. I'm 100% immersed in the situation and you know what is happening around me. And I just try to tell the story at hand as accurately and as aesthetically as possible. 
And if my photographs invoke certain kind of emotion, that is because that's what I witnessed. That's just what happened there. You know, in my world, uh, reality is more dramatic than a drama. You have been quite extensively covering and following up on the aftermath of the Sewol disaster, and your work, I think, has been quite noted. What was the the spark that made you that made you follow this story more than any other? What do you what do you see in this tragedy that warrants somehow this dedication of yours? I was really um, sucked into this turmoil or oh, disaster, if you will. I didn't get any assignment as a photographer during the initial phase of the disaster of the sinking, but I was contacted by uh, NPR's Beijing bureau. Mm-hmm. I went down there, uh, went, went down to Jindo. Um, as a fixer for NPR, and what I witnessed there over the next three, four days uh, just stuck with me. Out of 304 victims, 250 of them are uh, high school students on a school field trip, and this, all these innocent kids perished due to layers of ineptitude and corruption. And what haunts me to this day is that there was time, there was time, still time to uh, save them. Some measures could have been implemented, and something could have been done better, hmm. and we might have uh, saved at least a few of them. And it it really hurts me that you know the entire nation watched the ship sink, go like on the water, and then we we literally watched the all these all these kids um, just perish live on TV. You touched upon it a little bit, but could you maybe run us through the chronology of the incident <laughs> for those who are maybe not familiar with it? What happened specifically and what was so severe? During the initial phase of the sinking, there was a lot of confusion and shunning of responsibility. The line of command was clearly dysfunctional, and the President Bakune's visit to Jindo on the day two did nothing to remedy that. You know, precious time slipped away, and the media reported that there was uh, the biggest rescue mission in South Korean history. But in reality, nothing was really done, and nobody, other than the initial batch of escapees, was that was was rescued. So you would say the situation wasn't properly handled by the by the authorities at all. Did we see any repercussions, politically speaking, for the government? The initial fall lies with the uh, captain and the crew. Mm. Uh, they they knew the ship was listing, but they abandoned the ship and the passengers and escaped the ferry first. And while they were escaping, like PA was telling all the passengers to stay put. And if they, if they had, had done something, a lot of them, a lot of the passengers would have, would have lived. And Jindo Vessel Traffic Service, under the control of the uh, Korean Coast, uh, Coast Guard, uh, failed to monitor the ferry when it was making sharp turns. And the Coast Guard's initial dispatch to the ship's distress call was just inadequate. There was just one boat that arrived there and it wasn't big enough um, to do anything really. So there are a lot of human errors and um, these errors turned uh, what could have been an accident into a full-scale disaster. My take is that the South Korean government's handling of the disaster and treatment of the bereaved families Mm. later on was another disaster in itself. The ferry disaster was a huge political liability to the current administration and the ruling Sanomi party. Uh, but in the end, it dealt a blow to the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy. How so? Um, the ruling party managed to level the opposition in the munis- municipal election last May, and it won the by-election in July by a landslide. And it gave them a wrong signal that the public didn't care as much about the Seoul as the liberals make up. And uh, it has paved the, paved the road for um, more inaction and political interference uh, over the um, independent commission that the families uh, fought over uh, last year. You have documented the father of one of the civil victims in particular, Kim Yong oh who went on an almost two-month-long hunger strike. You called him in an article uh, a reluctant icon. Can you tell us about his combat and what do you see in this man, both as a militant or citizen and, of course, as an artist or, or as a photographer that you are? From the very beginning of the ferry sinking, I guess I wanted to put a human face onto the tragedy and follow an individual just as long as I can. By sure chance, I was introduced to Mr. Kim. On July 16th, 2014, uh, 15 bereaved families, they embarked on a hunger strike 
mm. to generate support for an independent commission that would fully investigate into the causes of the disaster. And Mr. Kim was one of them. And nobody really knew that his fast would last for 46 days. And I wasn't certainly expecting that. I call him a reluctant icon because he's just an ordinary father, just a working class man, a really good natured person who got sucked into this turmoil. It wasn't his, his intention to seek fame or make name, but his life was completely turned upside down uh, during and after the hunger strike. And he inadvertently uh, emerged as this icon of the whole Seoul movement and as this anti-government figure. And he was mocked and vilified to unimaginable uh, degree by the country's right-wing faction. Kim's struggle and transformation is somewhat extreme, um, but it, it is illustrative of the collective experience of the Seoul families. Mm. You'd be surprised how soft-spoken uh, these parents are if you meet them in person. They were once ordinary citizens and taxpayers and parents, but they had no choice but to walk into this political arena. Where do you strike the balance between documenting the plight of the Seoul families and taking a militant approach? I think we already talked a bit about that, but how does it translate into the daily work? I would like to uh, turn around your question on this, mm -hmm. um, about the militant approach. Because I think your question is the very proof that Seoul has become a polarizing topic in Korea. From the beginning, my approach has been consistent. Uh, I was empathetic towards the suffering of the families of missing passengers. And I was trying to tell the story. Uh, it was a simple story back then. You know, the entire nation was in mourning. Uh, everyone was devastated and, and outraged that such a thing could happen in this modern Korea. You know, so many lives, so many innocent lives fell victim to it. However, um, as all of the families of the missing passengers eventually became the families of the deceased, they started demanding answers regarding why the children had to die and why the rescue efforts failed. And the family struggle became uh, more of a social activism cause. Mm. Um, I was empathetic then, I'm still empathetic, but now my work comes off as biased to some uh, because the Seoul has become politicized. The whole context and connotation surrounding the Seoul has changed over the past year. And now I come off as, a, as taking a side. It also means that many have lost sympathy towards the families. What is your assessment of how the media handled the whole disaster? Uh, and I'd like to refer to one specific event, uh, the many me media news outlets showcased the students' belongings on their desks and, you know, tried to kind of play this whole emotional pathos. Is that acceptable? Is that, is that something that you think um, was, was... There were so many ethical questions um, during the early stages. There one particular incident with a photojournalist, like, digging into a victim's locker and laying out all the belongings on the writing desk. That's just not ethical at all. And the South Korean media... They, uh, they didn't really do a good job representing the story or digging into these uh, layers of problems. As a photojournalist, you know, you never really stage things unless you're taking a portrait. Mm. And you must make it known in a caption that, you know, you post something. But there was no such uh, consensus among journalists and they were being quite rude and forward and uh, exploitative in many cases. And a lot of the families got really turned off by this um, sort of senseless approach. And I like to make a note on a general uh, media landscape of Korea. Hmm. One of the main problems with the Seoul and other uh, disasters is that in South Korea, a lot of interns or first-year journalists, they go down to difficult disaster zones, while um, journalists with more experience, they tend to get promoted and end up in managerial jobs, hmm. managerial positions. So there was a lot of inexperience. All these journalists, most of them, I would say, were quite young, and they didn't really know what they were doing. But there was so much pressure to break news, basically. And it just shed a light on South Korean journalism. What is the role of art and pictures in the family struggle, and the photography in particular? Do you see your medium as a weapon? Um, and I think we already talked about, you know, the deceased children's empty rooms, the, these gaping holes, so to speak, that can never be filled, or how 
how the, the families would show these lines and lines of passport photos that give this this disturbing feeling of anonymity. Do do they do they? I'm not sure it's the right word, but do they play you know with the image to to really get the message across? Mm, I think that's really an important question. Personally, I don't really think of my medium as a weapon. Mm. I think of myself and my photographs as a vessel or conduit, if you will. I'm just trying to tell stories that I feel are important. In the case of the Empty Room series, photo series, mm. it was actually a group of photographers that came out with the idea and they approached the families and they, they made like rounds. So you sort of have to get that, get that fact straight. Then, in my, in my observation, I think a lot of families they didn't really understand the power of photography in the beginning, but now it's more like they get it more intuitively that it can be used as a tool to uh, get their messages across. You have been following the families quite regularly, as we mentioned. You've been documenting their lives post-tragedy. How did they initially cope with it? And how did their actions evolve over time? And most importantly, perhaps, how are they holding up? Many of them believe that the government would do its job, uh, bring light to the circumstances of sinking, and penalize uh, those responsible. But as time passed on, they felt they were being neglected and sometimes being monitored. Uh, I remember them sitting quietly on the night of May 8, 2014. That is uh, Parents' Day in mm. South Korea. They marched from Ansan to Seoul, holding funerary portraits of their children. and. Even then, of course, there was this sense of anger. They were confused. They were tired. But at the same time, I think they were trying to trying really hard to be patient and soft in their criticism. They were just waiting for the government to do the right thing. And that eventually didn't happen. And so how did they hold up afterwards? Well, unfortunately, my impression is that the government's approach to the disaster has been uh, more about uh, damage control mm. from the very beginning and their general inaction and neglect aggravated PTSD that the families are suffering and pushed the parents to take the matters into their own hands. I would say they're holding up pretty bad. Most of them are suffering from uh, PTSD mm. and some are having financial difficulties. Mm. I know you know the victims also have siblings. They are, some of them are still I would say most of them are still receiving treatments at a trauma center in Ansan. And last year, one of the 50 surviving students attempted a suicide. And it is quite uh, unfortunate, but I mean, they need long-term care. You wrote that you were really struck by their strong sense of Han. Can you explain this, this very Korean concept to our listeners who may not be familiar with it? Um, Han is profound angst to the core of one's being. I don't think there is an English word for it. Mm. You're not just angry or sad. Your entire body and soul are suffering and is paralyzing. It is deeply ingrained in your being. There is even Korean saying, when a woman harbors Han, it can make frost fall in May or June. So it's a quite, a, quite a profound feeling. How did the families frame the tragedy in the beginning and now, of course, in relationship to politics? Would you say some victims or f families of the victims are now more political or, or some less? Did they become divided by politics? Are they still in together? Did you see families who were absolutely apolitical suddenly develop a strong, keen interest in politics? And especially now it's been over a year, so things must have changed. How, how was the, the political journey of these people, would you say? I would say um, a lot of the parents didn't really know or care about politics even Mr. Kim, the hunger striker, mm. told me that he didn't even vote. He was just too busy working all the time. And some parents were certainly afraid of uh, you know, repercussions of coming off as politically motivated and taking jabs at uh, the current administration and President Park Geun-hye. But a lot of them also felt that they had no other choices. Uh, they stood united throughout last year, but as their struggle was met with strong resistance, and worsening public opinion. A lot of them stop partaking in rallies. They also have to make a living. Hmm. Although a lot of the families feel that they haven't found closure yet, some of them are trying to get back to their normal lives. My observation is that they wanted to seek a political solution or mediation and 
became a politically interest group of sorts um, out of desperation, really. Mm. After such an incident, it is quite normal, I think, for the victims to ask for reparations, for, for compensation. What did the survivors and families of the civil ask for? And related to that, what is the desired outcome of their struggle and what did the government grant them? I think you're absolutely right on that. Mm -hmm. I think the families should be given proper compensation and reparation. But there has been a lot of guilt tripping about money, especially from the conservative side. Uh, their demand throughout the past year was consistently about independent inquiry into, into this disaster. Uh, so that something like this doesn't happen again. But rumors spread about their intent and conservative, conservative groups and media tried to paint them as seeking compensation, monetary compensation and privilege from their misfortune. And it has been over a year and a lot of families are in dire financial, financial circumstances. They are skeptical and opposed to receiving reparation mainly due to the uh, automatic legal reconciliation clause which is built into the memorandum. Mm -hmm. The deadline for uh, application is September 28th. So we'll have to s see and uh, wait how many uh, of them will actually apply for it. The civil families, you, you wrote tirelessly advocate for one thing, the truth. And what do they mean by that? Have, have the information and investigation provided by the government not, not been sufficient? What kind of information are they seeking that would bring them that peace that they're looking for? There are many unanswered questions and the mistrust of the government and the press has been prevalent from the very, very beginning. The families generally feel that the government has, has been interfering with truth-seeking uh, truth process and making scapegoats uh, instead of uh, fully owning accountability. Hmm. But unfortunately, the government has all the information and a lot of families feel that they've been withholding it. And the communication between the families and the government has been bumpy. And this lack of investigation and information has led to a few conspiracy theories, which I really think is unfortunate. Hmm. And the family's grieving and suffering has been prolonged by this general absence and mistrust. What has the government actually provided to the, to the victims? Did they offer some, some money? Did they offer anything else, practical support? Yeah, I think they, they did provide certain uh, mental care, like counseling. And the Danon High School probably, got, I think, got some funding and a special status because just so many students died there. The only thing that the government gave to families could be the salvaging of the ship. Yes, that has been quite a big point of contention. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that the families didn't get closure on how the government handled the disaster, yes. Mm -hmm. But how do you justify bringing the ship out of the water, because it's still down there, right, uh, for no other purpose than really spending the taxpayers' money? What kind of information would they get out of it? What kind of truth? And I'm, I'm obviously playing the devil's advocate here, but I think this is an argument that we have heard a lot from the conservative side, and more and more the apolitical majority in the country has been falling also on that side. Mm -hmm. that, well, what, what's the point of you know spending so much money to bring that thing out of the water? What will they get it? Well, what will they get out of it? Um, from the family's perspective, the ship in its, in itself is a bit of an evidence. Um, I don't know what uh, what do you call it for ships, but it may have like a black box of sorts. And if you can retrieve retrieve it from the ship, it may uh, shed light on what really happened and and, and why uh, the ship. Uh, made sharp turns before uh, capsizing. And also from the family's perspective, there are still nine uh, unretrieved bodies that are believed to be trapped inside the ship. I guess it could come off as unreasonable mm. to certain people. Of course, you can argue that it's a lot of tax money, but if you think about it, there are 304 victims and I would say about 500 to 1,000 direct family members and they are taxpayers too, you know. All these students could have, they would have been taxpayers. I don't know how much they would have paid. And as citizens and nationals of, of South Korea, I think they are certainly entitled to uh, uh, certain privileges. And this could be one of it. And this is like a personal story, but uh, a lot of people, including myself, have been affected by the cell mm -hmm. disaster. I know a few people who just quit playing guitar or stopped painting because they just couldn't do it. Like the entire country was shaken 
the national psyche was shaken and destroyed and it just made no sense for them to continue doing what they were doing. So I think bringing the ship and having a kind of closure which has not been available to the families and also to the South Korean public, it could be a symbolic gesture mm. and also it could have side effects that are greater than those financial losses. Mm. Why haven't we seen any results, so to speak, even though so many people are working on it, you know, campaigning, demonstrating? Is it just the, the government being incompetent and stubborn or, or do you think there is unnecessary antagonism on both sides and, and maybe there is room for criticism of the victims in the sense that they did not pursue the right strategy? I know it sounds a bit harsh, but where do you put somehow the, the, the blame, so to speak, in terms of getting results? You, can, you could argue that both are to blame government and the families, but it's certainly true that the government has been quite stubborn and resistant to the investigative efforts. The uh, independent commission that was enabled by the special law uh, hasn't been able to do its job because mm. the government has been interfering. I just read an article that uh, the South Korean government cut funding by uh, 44% and the committee only got, I think it was 9 billion won. Nine million dollars. Yeah, nine million dollars. And a lot of things were actually cut down. You can say that the, the families could have done something better or something different. But you also have to remember these are not professional activists. Mm. They were being aided by more liberal-minded activists and lawyers. I think one critical mistake they made uh, as, a, as a group could be that when they were pushing for the Seoul Special Law, they were demanding authorities to subpoena information and also to indict those responsible. At that time, I, th I thought that was a bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. I think it was more of like a bargaining tool that lawyers came out with. But it, it, is, it was quite unfortunate that the families took it quite literally and the lawyers didn't really um, do their job persuading mm -hmm. and explaining to the families. It could have been a uh, you know, matter of strategy yeah, there, of course you can find faults in both sides, but, but I do believe um, the government has a lot more uh, loopholes. Mm -hmm. How is the, the National Commission you mentioned constituted? Who, who are the members? I'm not quite sure on the details now. I think there are about 15 appointed members. And Korea Bar Association uh, appoints four people, and the opposition party appoints a few people, and then... Um, the ruling party appoints, I think, four people. So technically, the opposition and Korean Bar Association have a bit of an upper hand, and they're deemed to be been more sympathetic towards the families. But the problem is the makeup of the committee uh, was a little bit tricky. The chairman doesn't have a lot of authorities. Actually, it's the, it's the vice chairman that has authorities to you know appoint civil servants. But that position was actually given to the ruling party. So there was a bit of a failure in negotiation that was pointed out later after the law was passed. Uh, and I think they're just embarking on the uh, investigative process just this month. And, you know, it's been one year and four or five months since the ferry sank. And that's the uh, official investigation. Only that, starting now. Yeah, yeah. That is starting now. It seems that after a while, the political discourse regarding the families of the Sewol quite shifted. In an article you wrote in April at the occasion of the disaster's first anniversary, Why Sewol Families Still Fight? You start off with arguments you heard from the conservative side. These families have been grieving for too long. Their mourning is shameless and uncivilized. It's not patriotic. What, what happened? Why, why did such a tragic event attract so little empathy? Why, why so much hatred, do you think? I think there is a degree of so-called uh, Sewol fatigue. As I said before, a lot of people were grieving collectively, uh, but then as it dragged on, people got sort of tired of hearing this unending sadness. And the role of the media is also important too. You also have to keep in mind that in South Korea, president appoints heads of two national TV and radio stations and one cable news station who in turn wield the authority over um, you know, editorial staff and journalists. And these companies, respective journalist unions, have been busted for opposing these parachuted chairmen. So it's kind of easy in Korea to deprive 
these already uh, marginalized people of a fair coverage. And also labeling a uh, Korean public as apolitical may be an understatement. Mm. Korean media coined this term politics phobia and it refers to the general indifference and downright contempt that Korean public have for anything political. On top of that, we have a culture of conformity and elements of Confucian education. And that makes room for a bit of a backward thinking and submission to authority. Sometimes politicians and presidents are considered more than elected representatives. Somehow they are considered higher or more authoritative. So I think you sort of have to factor in everything. And especially when the Seo families came into this political arena and started criticizing President Park Geun-hye, I think that really defined the course of their struggle. Uh, President Park Geun-hye has this support base from her uh, late dictator father, uh, Park jong hees regime, which lasted for 26 mm-hmm. years. And many of the older generation think fondly of that period as their and the nation's uh, heyday. And, you know, the current president's approval rating uh, has been rock solid at around 30%, despite political scandals and her uh, general underperformance. Mm. And I think by criticizing Park geun I mean, Seo families definitely turn these older generation mm. against them. Political apathy is, is one side, but how do you explain the, really the hatred? For example, the fact that some very far-right groups came to uh, where the civil families were demonstrating, actually fasting, and they decided to have this binge eating in front of them. That's, you know, how do you explain the hatred towards people who are, who are grieving, who lost their, their children? I can only speculate and, you know, mm-hmm. offer you my, uh, my take on this. Uh, but my observation is that a lot of South Korean people are unhappy and angry about their own lives. That right-wing group that came out is called Ilbe, mm-hmm. and it has become a big social problem. And some critics actually argue that Ilbe may not be just like a small fraction of the society. That is the general consensus we share. But these critics argue that South Korean society in itself actually is becoming like Ilbe. And, you know, we have very little uh, social safety net, very hyper-competitive um, environment from the very early age. Students are not necessarily treated as human beings, but they're almost treated as commodities to manage, even in schools. And they go through grueling years of preparing for uh, that one final exam, you know, college entrance exam. And mm-hmm. you know, as Seung argued in his article, I think it, it borders on uh, child abuse. And a lot of people are really, they have built up anger and they just don't know uh, how to think or act differently. Just the, the pressure of conformity and excellence or excelling um, is so high that it's more like a, you know winner takes all kind of situation. And it's it's actually kind of noteworthy that these angry young men like Ilbe who are, who are showing hatred, who are acting out on this hatred, they are also from marginalized groups, victims in a way. Yeah, you know, victims. Yeah, they are they're victims and they are in the lower uh, social strata. And it's almost like dog eating dog effect. Of course, when I first saw this you know, horrendous behavior, I was angry and I was upset. But I think I became a bit more sympathetic. I'm trying to understand. Maybe after say, well, maybe when I when I have time, maybe I'll follow someone. You know, I find someone who does ill bit and follow that person. There's something that I'm thinking about to show the other side of the story. You say dog eat dog, but is that really true? Um, Even at Seoul National University, there are students who seem to be following Ilbe quite closely. Ilbe has become, it started out as a humor site. But the problem with that website and that culture is that it victimizes only underprivileged, like women, disabled, migrant workers. They're literally taking out their anger on these already socially marginalized people. In a way, I think it's a little bit cowardly because they are not really voicing themselves against uh, you know, greater evil, like authorities and policymakers. But in a way, it's not just uh, Korea. I, I, I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. I think people's notions are very, getting very conservative and uh, in a way very self-centered. Going back to the Seoul, what do you make of the fact that President Park Geun-hye left on a tour to South America right before the anniversary of the Seoul 
and that if I am correct, on that very day she was meeting with Peruvian K-pop fans. <laughs> My impression is that President Bakune just didn't want to deal with the Sewa. She was in Jindo on April 17, 2014, and um, she also met with the families after their um, their protest outside the uh, presidential palace on the parents' day. That, as I said, that was just before the municipal election. My take is that it was a PR move for her to sway the public opinion. And then she promised the families that she would meet with them anytime they wanted, but President Park didn't really follow through with her promise. Hmm. So, yeah, of course, there, there have been these signs of insincerity and indifference from President Park Geun-hye. I don't, I don't really think something like this could have happened, say, in the U.S. or France. I think that particular president would have been under a lot of fire. Hmm. Say, if President Obama missed the 9-11 memorial <laughs> and went down to, say, Korea and like did Gangnam Style dance, that would have been a huge political um, scandal and also big liability. But as I said, I think media landscape is very much skewed here. So it didn't really get fair uh, coverage or representation. In the article we spoke about before, you, you wrote, any expectation I had for South Korea as a modern democratic state disappeared from my mind after seeing how this government handles the ferry disaster and treats the victims, families and survivors. It's quite harsh. What did you mean by that? What do you see in this disaster that makes it so structural, so to speak, in terms of South Korea's democratic fabric? I think Seoul has revealed many problems and uh, contradictions uh, within the Korean society. Koreans and the Korean government obsess over uh, the national image and appearance and presentation of themselves. But I find it's all surface. In nature, it is very authoritarian and rigid. If you challenge authorities, then you're likely to get into trouble. And that deters all these whistleblowers. We We don't really hear from whistleblowers anymore. In my opinion, I think South Korean government didn't do enough or it wasn't willing to bring justice and and truth that the families were demanding. Uh, One specific incident that's kind of noteworthy is uh, and and that that uh, sheds light into the Korean society is that um, two of the victims, they're teachers, but they're on contract. They don't have a permanent job. Other other teachers who who died on, on the ferry they were acknowledged uh, doing duty. Their sacrifices were acknowledged and they would get special uh, status and they'll probably go to the national uh, cemetery in Korea. And these two teachers, they didn't get it because they were contract workers. Like people have been rallying and urging the government to look into the case because uh, certain surviving students, they testified that these teachers, these two teachers, were actually on the upper deck, but they went inside the ship to save the students. That's why they perished. So it's a, it's a noble sacrifice, right? But the South Korean government has been very slow or reluctant to acknowledge these sacrifices. I do agree with the family's sentiment that the government hasn't done its job properly. They have let down the families and also the general public who have been affected by the disaster. I'd like to conclude with the uh, demonstrations on the first anniversary of the Seoul tragedy. They were rather severe troubled in downtown Seoul. Was this a collective expression of anger towards the government with the Seoul as a catalyst or, or focus point unwillingly or willingly? Or do you see this as the establishment really of the Seoul families movement as a new political platform for change with ideas such as more transparency, more accountability, impartial justice. Is this the beginning of something really structured? First of all, I'd like to uh, point out that the severe troubles in downtown Seoul were actually caused by the police, mm-hmm. setting up walls of uh, you know, police buses. I think the downtown Seoul was pretty much locked down on the day of the first anniversary, and pedestrian access was not uh, granted, and that's uh, unconstitutional. Constitutional Court ruled against such strategy uh, back in, I think, 2011 or something. There was a clear overreaction, and as James Pearson of Reuters noted, if you cattle with buses 
all these pedestrian access or passages, the buses will get smashed. Mm. So I think there was a bit of a setup by the police as well. As for protests or confrontation, I'm not really comfortable seeing these parents in, in the context of confrontation and protest. I don't really know uh, what we can possibly achieve uh, through these protests when the receiving end of the negotiating table is quite unrestrictive. But I do, I do believe that these children's deaths should not be in vain. So for that, we definitely need to um, bring about certain changes. And personally, I think every 10 years or so, Korea has uh, witnessed certain disasters. In 2002, we had a subway disaster in Daegu, mm-hmm. which was caused by, uh, caused by an arsonist and claimed hun- uh, hundreds of lives. And back in uh, 1994 or 5, we had a department store mm-hmm. in Gangnam that, and, and it collapsed. And with the Sewol, I think it's still reverberating because maybe because of social media. So, you know, if this kind of thing happens like every decade, someone might fall victim. Someone that I know might fall victim to it. And uh, structurally, as I argued, Koreans are really good at presentation. And making the surface look pretty, but there are many other many questions here uh, regarding Seoul. Like, are we doing enough job? Are we raising awareness on public safety, or are we reverting back to our old habits? I'm hoping that Seoul will become a bit of a uh, become a bit of a legacy. Otherwise, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I can. <laughs> I don't think I can handle it if something like this happened to my mm-hmm. own family. I, I like to see. I like to see Korea changed over the course of next few years. June Michael Park, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you so much. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.